Thank you, Roger. Well, it is absolutely lovely to be here. And this morning, um, this morning was a kind of revelation from so many different angles on the, the self. And I did notice that the emails uh, very kindly inviting me and then telling me about it. There was a slight mutation from self-portraiture to self-expression. And I think this blurring of the, of the um, visual and the, um, the, the verbal is, is very much in the spirit of this gathering. Well, I'm going to start with the idea of what is a self that has been thrown around the place in the last 24 hours. <clears throat> and one of the things that came out of Julian's lovely talk was the idea that you're at the discovery of the space between, that is the space between self and other. And, um, and of course the infant is first defined by the gaze of the mother, um, the other. So I, and of course that happens when you fall in love too. So I'm going to start with a kind of love poem. And um, John last night finished with a new poem. And whenever you have a new poem and you haven't read it before, you never know how it's going to go into that space between. So this one is called Encontre des Aguas. I don't know if any of you have been to the place on the Amazon where one river marches along beside the other. And because they're different densities, the waters don't mingle, they go together and then eventually they mingle. And this is really about a kiss but I'm calling it En Contra des Aguas. It is unlike anything else. Wild swimming. The nub of selves meeting. Conflux of two rivers, the dark and the gold. Rio Negro and Rio Solinoes in Brazil. The kiss. Nerve ends twisting together underground. Each name touched, cherished, and forgotten in a time really can stand still that makes us shiver. No more Durga, she who is difficult to reach. We are a whole shaman's journey in ourselves. The invisible bridge, a quest to the interior. Any what do you think of me's dissolve in each other's dark? A promise that may never be fulfilled, but is complete each moment in itself. Well, there's a famous quotation from Baudelaire that I'll show you later about two lovers looking at each other like flames repeating in a mirror. I'm sure you all know it, um, but this, um, that was one of the things behind this poem, which was written to two friends of mine. They both died now. They were both Greeks from the diaspora, one from R Romania and one from um, Marseille. They were born there to, on the whole, Greek, Greek bourgeois families in the shipping trade or in the rag trade. And when war broke out, they were teenagers, young teenagers, and both their families packed them up and took them back to their respective home islands where they'd never been. So they grew up as teenagers in these different islands. One was Catalonia and one was Mykonos. Um, and um, of course, island life is quite defining. So I'm thinking of the self as flame, the self as island, and then the meeting. And it's from a sequence called What You Told Me About Islands. This is called The Two Flames. Let's say you found each other like repeating flames in an antique mirror, trailing the memory of two Greek ports in foreign lands where you were born. Add to islands you fled back to when the devil began to dance in mad Evropi and you learned the island song of eternal ritornel. One hot gold summer when you find yourself, then rage to get away, dark winter alcohol, high winds to cut you off, a closed in gray horizon, and a harbor where all your debts and fantasies are known. While beyond the mountain, one small bay waits on, never not dreamed of, lifelong loved and left. The soul is a wanderer and fugitive, 
driven by decrees and laws of gods. Well, you probably recognize that, that last quotation is from Empedocles. And here is the um, Baudelaire. Um, I just thought you'd like that because somebody was talking today at lunch, I love these conversations at lunch, about musical quotations and about how every note, really, as soon as you get two notes together, there is a quotation by the next composer onwards. And so it is with poets, really, I think. Um, okay, so there's similarity in gaze, in, in self and other, looking at each other. What about difference? This, these are the paintings that Charles Darwin and his cousin paint, had painted of themselves when they were engaged, before they were married, 1838. They knew each other terribly well. They'd known each other from childhood. Um, but there was an agonizing difference. And after they got engaged, there's a fantastic stream of love letters. This lonely young man who'd been around the world um, suddenly, you know, once his cousin had accepted him, opened his heart. And you can read them online, the correspondence project of Charles Darwin, and they're wonderful love letters. But there was this problem about God. He wasn't at that point a complete, you know, he hadn't gone as far as he later did in losing his faith, but he had to tell her that he didn't quite believe all of it. And she wrote him a sweet letter then. And then when she was pregnant, she wrote him another letter. By then they were living with each other um, in um, Gower Street. And the big problem for sort of upper middle class educated families, couples at that time was that the men were beginning to disbelieve some bits of the Bible. And it was, salvation was a sort of key thing. And Emma got agonized by the thought that if she died in childbirth, they wouldn't be together forever because he would go to hell because he didn't believe. And so, didn't believe in salvation. And this, it's an extraordinary document, this document, it's in the University Library in Cambridge now, uh, given by my grandmother, who is his granddaughter. And um, first of all, there is on this Emma's letter, written when she was sort of about three or four months pregnant in um, the autumn of 1838, or no, the autumn of 1839. Um, and she just wants to express what she says, what she feels. She writes him a note about salvation. When I talk to you face to face, I cannot say exactly what I wish. Her back aches. She never goes out. His friend's wife has died in childbirth. You say you are uncertain about Christian revelation, but your opinion is still unformed. He's told her his discoveries. She'd love him to be right in everything. She's very afraid he's not. Faith is beyond our comprehension, not provable in the scientific way you like. I believe you sincerely wish to learn the truth, but there are dangers in giving up revelation and Christ's offer of eternal life, and in the sin. I know you will have patience with your own dear wife, of ingratitude for his suffering, for you, for everyone. I do not wish an answer. It is satisfaction for me just to write. My fear is for the afterlife. I cannot say how happy you make me in this one, nor how dearly I love you. I thank you for all the affection which makes my happiness more and more each day. But everything that concerns you concerns me. I should be most unhappy if I thought we would not belong to each other for eternity. Well, this document in the University Library has his writing on the outside. He left her note among his papers for her to find, and he died in 1882. That's more than 40 years after, and he'd written on it. He leaves a message on the edge. He kept her note all his life. He must have said something then, but he wrote to her too on the outer fold, 
No one knows when. He was maybe quite old. He wasn't blind to where his thought led, what she thought she'd lose. When I am dead, no, I have kissed and cried over this many times. So, um, difference. Let's stay with difference about the self. And this is difference not between one person and another, but between the mind and the world. And this is a really crucial. He wrote this to her when he was engaged, <coughs> when they were engaged. Um, and I love that bit that I've, I've italicized. The whole of my pleasure was derived from what passed in my mind whilst admiring the forests and the deserts or pacing the deck of the beagle. And this is sort of where, we, where I think art and science both start with this beneficial creativity and the space between the mind and the world. I couldn't resist this. This is Anaxagoras, Opsis tona de lo nomena, appearance is a sight of the unseen. Um, from his thing on nature, and that's some um, from it's it's in the Athens, um, it's in Athens this this 20th 19th century fresco, and that's Anaxagoras looking at the world, um, and this is the artist, the solitary self, that um, is where poetry comes from. And this is the beginning of art. This is Peshmel, the spotty horses 40,000 years ago, the cave art in the Pyrenees in France and Spain. And what I want to focus on are the hands. And it seems to me that this, in a way, is humanity's first self-portrait. Mixing in, the hands were made a little later than the, than the horses. Um, and the, the hands were made by putting the hand there and blowing pigment <coughs> on, the, on the cave wall. And the, the French you know, discovered them and called them the les mains négatifs. And of course, there's not only missing absent hands, there's also absent breath. There's the lost breath of whoever did that, who has put themselves, put a portrait of part of themselves on the wall. I mean, I was very interested when faces kept coming up to, today, but so did hands, the, the, um, the self as hand, the hand as self. Well, I wanted here, to read something which is sort of mixing in um, science and self. This is, <clears throat> I don't know how much you all know about magnetite. Magnetite um, used to be thought, and it was discovered in magnesia, that's why it's called magnetite, and then the Greeks said that there was a shepherd called Magnes who discovered it. Um, it used to be thought it was just something that was in inorganic matter that had this weird property of pulling matter towards it, magnet magnetism. But then there was this brilliant geologist called Hans Lowenstein who discovered that um, homing mollusks had bits of magnetite in the tops of their teeth, which drew them to, to, to got them to go home. And everybody's geologists poured a score on this. And then it was discovered that there were bacteria, magnetotactic bacteria, that, that went to true north in puddles. And so from then on, it, biomagnetism was discovered, and it, that everything has magnetite in it. All living forms, we can, the fossil record goes back to sort of fungi and crocodiles. There's one life form that doesn't, and that's us. And we, of course, have words and things instead. So, uh, but it's so interesting. It has actually, in the last five years, been discovered that we do have bits of magnetite in our brains, but they don't, doesn't seem to be useful at all. It's just a sort of um, leftover from the necessary iron in our body, anyway. Lodestone. I am Magnes the shepherd, who found a pebble stuck to a nail in his boot and discovered the mineral attract. I am Heinz Lowenstein, geologist from Silesia, who identified magnetite in tooth caps of a homing mollusk. I am magnetotactic bacteria knitted with crystals which orient to Earth's magnetic field. 
I am also your garden robin, who reads geomagnetic lines the way you scan a newspaper, navigating folded thunderclouds at night by neural pathways of cluster N wired to my left eye from light processing regions of the brain. I am the photoreceptor protein which draws young monarch butterflies hatched on a month-long journey to the same old Mexican forest their ancestors knew. I am salamander, spiny lobster, bee, crocodile and whale, and also that flock of cranes passing silently over the moon. I am fish, mammal, fungi and bird. I am two billion years of life forms steering by the minerals of which I am made, a molecular feel for the pull of the earth. What about us, poor wanderers with no inner compass? You inscribe the globe. You map. You have words. You foresee your death. Isn't that enough? Well, I should have, uh, perhaps I should have said that magnetite is one of the things that, that homing birds, that migrating birds use. Okay, now, who is this you? Who, are the you? who is the you in your head? Who is the you that you talk to? When one, well, in French one says on, but in, in English, it, we personalize it, we say you. And um, I think this is the, it's the basis of empathy and compassion. I'm thinking also of Aristotle's um, explanation of the emotions we feel on watching a tragedy, pity and fear. You pity the other as other, but you fear when you see the other, whether it's Oedipus or Lear, as self. And um, there's a wonderful passage in Homer's Ajax when Odysseus is made to see Ajax, who tried to kill him, mad. And he says, I, 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 I pity him, although he is an enemy to me, for I see we all are, all we who live, just empty shadows. So he's pitying, although he's afraid of this man, he's fearing because he sees his own image, his own life in that. So this is the other as mirror of self, but also the other as other, which empathy, empathy depends on both. And um, this book on migration I wrote, started with the migration of selves and the body and then went on to birds and stuff and magnetite. Um, but then it went on to what's happening now. And I published this book two years ago and the migrant, the mi what's happening with migrants now is so all tragic that um, one, we can't really can't encompass it. And I, I wondered if part of this um, d detestation of migrants now in Britain anyway, and in Europe, a lot of the Europeans are, are not wanting to help Italy, Greece and Spain and so on, is because one sees oneself in them and rejects that self, rejects the persecuted, homeless, un unhoused image of self. Well, this one is, this poem is a called, from that sequence, and it's called The Prayer Labyrinth, coming from some of those cathedrals who have prayers um, a, a sort of labyrinth and maze in which you follow to get to the middle, which is enlightenment. The Prayer Labyrinth. She went looking for her daughter. How many visit Hades and live? Your only hope is the long labyrinth of visa application interviews with a volunteer from a charity you're not allowed to meet. You've been caught by a knock on the door at dawn, hiding in a truck of toilet tissue, or just getting stuck in a turnstile. You're on Dead Island, a detention center. The Russian refugees who leapt from the 15th floor of a Glasgow tower block to the Red Road, Springburn. Sergei, Tatiana, and their son, who, when immigration officers were at the door, tied themselves together before they jumped knew what was coming. Anyway, you're here. Evidence of cigarette burns all over your body has been dismissed by the latest technology. You're dragged from the room, denied medication or a voice. You can't see your children. They're behind bars somewhere else. You go on hunger strike. You're locked in a corridor three days without water, then handcuffed through the biopsy on your right breast. You've no choice but to pray and walk the never-ending path of meditation on 
not yet. Your nightmare was homegrown. Your seeking, sanctuary. They say you don't belong. They give you a broken finger, a punctured lung. Well, above all, you is Christ. That is in the Western tradition. Um, and this is from a, sequ a sequence, I won't, I'll only read two of them, on the seven last words of Christ. And when I was working on this, it was a commission to, to um, link in with a uh, string quartet playing Haydn's seven last words. So I did nothing for three months but read theology and listen to the Haydn over and over again. And I realized that the seven last words are an arc from attending to other to attending to self, which releases you, fulfills you, and you can join God, who is another other, I suppose. Um, so you, first of all, you have the word of forgiveness. You're forgiving the torturers. Then you're comforting, the Christ is comforting, you know, this night I promise you'll be with me in paradise. And then he's looking after his mother and the, the disciple. And then he turns and accepts and confronts his own suffering, um, the word of abandonment. Um, why hast thou forsaken me? And then his own need, I thirst, in the Ipsao in Greek. And after that he can say, it's done. And then there is the word of reunion. So um, I'm going to read the word of abandonment, which is, is the self alone. I mean, Seamus, Seamus Heaney there is talking about the self alone and the in creating. But the self abandoned is something equally in the dark, but a quite awful and negative dark. And I love the way that Julian talked about the dark background and the beginning of the beginning of the enlightenment is the beginning of darkening of the background of the self in painting is just was just revelatory. Okay, this is the word of abandonment. What breeds about the smokehouse of the heart? This is it now the central ceremony of let's not look away from the great stone ring of you on your own under a rug of flies. The bubble wrap of viscid spittle down your chin has dried like gluey fire consumed by its own ash. New agony begins, crushing pain in the deep chest. The fortress membrane built like the wall of China as a double palisade to keep in roots of the aorta, vena cava, pulmonary vein. And this shump, shump of muscle pushing blood through shattered cells is silting up with serum and starts to compress the heart. Eclipse. Where's healing now? You've lived for others' feelings. You've seen darkness over earth, the forked stick on the path. Now it's mucus on the lip, mouths of wounds peeling to black. You long to melt the air, but you've no choice except the ancient tongue called vulnerability. This was it, your one shot at experience, circumference of human skin, swirling bitumen of self. This is the ocean floor of all you've been, that you're alone with pain. That's what you're for. No angels around now to make wise men go home by another route, avoiding the jealous king who persecutes, who says, OK, destroy your own. Untouchable means separate. Where have you taken me? You trusted to a lifelong call, mistakenly. It must have been echo or projection. Watch the double walls of the pericardium slip against each other like wet leaves that overflow with serum. Shout in a loud voice, and the new metallic tasting dark translates. My God, why have thou forsaken me? Actually, I'm not going to read any more of those because otherwise we won't get to Ian and you won't get to, to tie your black ties. Um, so um, I'm going to move on from Christ, but I'm thinking of Christ in those poems. And when I read them, priests often came up and, and I concentrated on the medical, the body um, and 
they felt that I, they emphasized Christ's humanity, the mirror of Christ, as it were, Christ in us. So this is Darwin delighting in the forests. This is something quite different. This is what we were talking about today. And Roger said something very interesting. What's, you know, I mean, the, really, the trouble with this, that I have with this is that the world, the whole world, is treated as background. And that is very different from this, when the camera is a tool to look through, to look at the world, um, which is what I feel that the hands in Peshmel are doing. That's why they're there, they're around it. Well, I started with Baudelaire and those mirrors, the mirrors of lovers. And Las Maninas has got this extraordinary play with mirrors. I mean, this is a, it's an extraordinary mind-blowing thing to do, to paint a portrait of the king and queen of Spain and put them in a mirror and make them the smallest figures among these 11 characters. And then you have the artist and the easel, which seems to be another mirror you cannot see. So I'm going to end with, that there was something said last night, which, um, no, today, in Nostrum's wonder, a wonderful film, um, which I didn't quite agree with. And this is about Vermeer. I think Vermeer does have a story to tell. And this story is the most extraordinary story of all. It's the one painting he didn't sell, even when he was poor. And Hitler tried to, tried to own it. Um, why is it, you know, it's, it's an astonishing st st story. And um, there are people here who know much more about it than me. Um, it's called The Art of Painting, but it's also called The Artist in His Studio. And who he's painting is a, is a Dutch girl disguised as the muse of history, disguised as a Minad. So there are, and he's got his back to us, and all he's got on his easel is the top of her crown. I think history stands for memory, and you can't have a self without memory. I mean, once, once memory goes, that is, it's, a, it's very hard. Um, and I'm also thinking about how the depthlessness of, of um, the selfie, as it were, that everything is in the foreground, that what's important is the foreground. Um, so I'm just going to read, finish this. This is, Jim said he was a, um, a historian, and this is dedicated to a, a historian friend of mine, Roy Foster, but it's about that painting, and it's called The Wild One, because I think as education changes and as images become more important than words, then we lose a sense of history and people start to distrust history or they recreate history. The Wild One. She stands beside a death mask under a chandelier, head turning from an unseen source of light. She's holding a leather Thucydides and a 17th century trumpet without piston, slide or valve, as if she doesn't know what to do with it and might prefer a lute. On the map behind, south is torn from north, the west on top, east nowhere. On the canvas, all that shows are glaucous leaves of laurel for her hair. The real picture, the one Vermeer never sold even at his poorest, is himself painting history in disguise as a menad. We might take her hand step her down from the frame, dress her in jeans and a t-shirt, open those eyes. She's not a scholar collating an archive, though she'll help if they're fair, nor a journalist after a story twisting what's said to make scandal sell, though she's on their side too if they mean well. She's blood from the heart's right ventricle, witness and balance, sift record and judge. Her name, Cleo, comes from glory, telling glorious things we did. But she's a wild one. Look at her, making us feel out of depth or guilty for not listening. Oh, she's foul play. She's dust on a galactic nebula, nothing to do with today. She'll spend centuries name-checked and dismissed. History's bunk. But she's all there is.